we are live or my end at least <laughs> and yeah, what's up it is crimson 60620 i am here with i teed it up for you and you're you just let it go oh uh i'm ryan i'm ryan francis i'm a cartoonist going on a few years and you know i've made two comics two indie comics so far and you know right now i'm currently been currently been making a whole bunch of freelance artwork i uh i freelance art a children's book i'm freelance arting on a bunch of games actually i'm currently working on a big early access steam game called furs of fury and i'm also working on my own indie game that's still starting development like it's still super early but you know if you follow me on twitter at masterfan uh yeah it's just masterfan m-a-s-t-a fran you can see a few sprite animations that i've been doing so that's what i've been up to all right let me get one second because i gotta get my second camera because i don't think they can see me on my stream hold on one second all right <clears throat> So I am back. What's up, Vegeta? How you doing today, man? All right, I'm back, man. So, um, you are. Tell yeah, me I'll about go back to the armor later. Tell me about your two, um, your two books. I've actually seen. The GameStop story, and I know that they're. I know you're working on some. I know you're working on Pizza Man. Oh, uh, that's done actually, or at least technically, the event was done. So, the Pizza Man. That's my most recent comic, and basically, it was an art challenge. Actually, that comic was an art challenge, and it was created by an artist named Gabe Batista. He's done a bunch of like way more professional stuff like he's worked on uh you know he's a dc colorist he's worked on the life after he's been an artist for uh, elephant man and a colorist for elephant men uh -huh. and overall he is a macho comics gorilla so you know if you're on instagram if you're an instagram guy i recommend following gabe batista or galvasaur if you can Well, one of the things that, like, I think we ran into each other when you and I first ran into each other. I forget where it was. I think it was the Comic Con, the Comic Revolution. Yeah, I believe it was Comic Con Revolution. And yeah, I was there with uh, Chris Scott and we were table sharing. And, you know, it was the first time that event was in town because I believe, uh, they were more in LA and Phoenix and stuff like that, but I think this was the first release. No, I think that that time that they did was the first ever time they've done it in the Chicago. Chicago. Area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, overall, I think it was my first ever. I wouldn't even say larger convention, but probably. My first convention that I've ever spent like three hundred dollars for a table on. Well, actually, me and Chris split the table, but still, it cost three hundred dollars to go there, which was fucking nonsense. But I was like, okay, I just need that exposure. I have two comics. I really want to get out there and hustle. <laughs> that that was pretty much my logic, and so you know. Me and Chris, we chatted with each other to just negotiate and split the table. And we didn't really sell much at there. I mean, we broke... I can't even say we broke even at that place, really. I'd say... No, we barely paid the, the off-the-table cost. I'd have to look it up again. but I don't think we actually made up 
table cost. And a lot of the other artists who were also there who I chatted with when I was wandering around there, they kind of said that it was just super slow. It was just... I, 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 Comic-Con Revolution seemed more like a... I think it seemed more like a celebrity con than an actual, you know, comic convention for indie artists and things like that. So that's kind of my rough opinion about Comic-Con Revolution because it was, I don't know. I, I personally, I'm personally not interested in coming back again because, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't above at all. I'd say it wasn't adequate. I, th I think there was um, a mis mis opportunity for their marketing. I think I that's think what so. it was. I I heard about it the day, the week before, mm. and so that marketing wasn't really there like they expected it to be. Mm. Um, with I probably made thirty dollars that whole convention. I definitely didn't make my my table calls back. Oh yeah. Um, and people were leaving. Oh seriously? Actually. Oh yeah, I think I remember. In. Yeah, totally. And so, um, what was that? A Saturday and a Sunday, and they yeah, closed yeah. the convention. They closed the convention pretty much right on time on on Sunday, where <laughs> it was closing at five. Yeah. I'm like. Your comic slash anime convention closes at seven on a Saturday. Oh no, it wasn't an anime five convention on a Sunday. at all. Don't don't get that wrong. It was absolutely not an <laughs> anime convention at all. I mean, there were a few like cosplayers and stuff like that. Like there's this one, mm -hmm. there's this one kid who kind of was hanging at my table a little too long, and I was a little too nice to make him go away. But hey, I made a sale from him. I, I stuck with him long enough to make the sale <laughs> but overall it was kind of like okay I was you know I was more in experience like this was I think last year was my first ever year tabling ever like at a comic convention mm -hmm. and you know I didn't know much about con stuff so you know that's that's kind of like, okay, what the heck do you do when somebody's just hanging at your table forever? You don't know that until you actually, I don't know, ask people about it. Well, you do what they do in um, GameStop and you um, let them stay. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, GameStop. I've been hearing so many stories about GameStop. I uh, I follow uh, Camelot331. I love hearing his stuff with... Uh, the GameStop stuff and the Amazon and everything like holy shit I, I follow him along myself and it's, it's just fucking amazing it's one of those things where it's just like I've worked retail before mm. and that was that was some crazy shit and like I'm in a call center now so I get to work from home oh, that's but nice. um, the thing about it is call center work is not too much different from retail Mm -hmm. um it's people dehumanize you there as well yeah that's shitty so, yeah, i used to uh work nights at walmart and it i mean to this day i consider it the absolute worst job i've ever had like i've worked as a pizza delivery driver i've worked at a you know distribution center like i've worked at fedex and macy's distribution and i've worked as game tester but I'd say by far Walmart was the absolute worst of the worst with that. Like, holy, like, it poisoned me from ever going to any Walmart ever again. I will never go to Walmart for as long as I live because of that. Because, like, I, I see you're going to be going to Target. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I now just go to Target and Jewel these days. And <laughs> I, I'm just done with Walmart. I mean, I still go to Sam's Club because there's no Costco's in my area. But I hear like there's gonna be one built like closer to the uh, the mall in my area, so that's gonna be pretty great. But I don't know about now, the membership. I want to say this, and like w um, we around the Chicago land area. Now I'm back in Chicago, and did you want to drop where the area? You don't have to drop address and shit like that. 
but uh, the area that you're in. Oh, I live out in Joliet. So if you're Blues Brothers fan, you know, I live out there. And um, one of the things with the local comic and art and anime scenes that like our areas do have a lot of great things. Um, I know I was supposed to go to Anime, Mid 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 ah, anime Midwest this year, but um, I saw you went to Comic Metropolis last year. Yes, so that's in uh, Lockport, and that's around, I'd say, five minutes away from the main Joliet City. And, you know, it's a smaller library convention. It's it's mostly, I'd say it's more of a community thing than a real big convention. But it's well run that, you know, I dig it. I like coming there. I, I have a personal, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit biased towards libraries, like I prefer libraries in general i i'm kind of the guy who will really will push to go to a library as much as he can like i'm i i love libraries i work at libraries i do a bunch of freelance artwork at libraries i love stumbling upon stumbling across books at libraries so that's pretty much you know so comic comic uh, comicopolis i believe Last year was the first ever time I've tabled at Comicopolis, but the year before that, I actually attended Comicopolis because it was like 20 minutes away from where I lived. So, you know, I stopped by and there were actually a few of my friends who was tabling at Comicopolis. Uh, uh, Brian B. Man, I can't pronounce his last name. The Bender Bird. But, uh, yeah, he makes I, yeah. Uh, Soul Chaser Betty. And you know we chat yeah, a lot um, with him. Yeah, uh, let's actually, see. Actually, actually, I he's the reason why I started going to conventions because oh, really? I was in the 2018. I went to the last day of the 2018 Anime Midwest, mm -hmm. and I was carrying around my own art and shit like that. And I bought one of his um, books, um, "Girls Gone Savage." Oh yeah, that's and, the uh, barbarian book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And like, that's also somebody I've been running into since I've, you know, started doing the scene. Um, and like, he was like, why, like, just draw the shit, like, just draw what you want to draw. And I was like, okay, cool. And it's been one of those things where it's just like, if you go to enough local conventions, you run into some of the same great people. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, did you go, did, did you go to the Maple or the Madison area public library one? I don't think so, no. I didn't get any information. Um, are you attending the Hammond one this year? I know that's one we were in together. Oh yeah, the Hammond one. Yeah. Uh it's a live it's an online one. Actually, yeah. it's an online con right now. But yeah, I'm uh gonna be, I believe, doing a live stream or something where I'm just gonna explain how you make mini comics and you know, just you know, just do a nice fast tutorial about you know holding up a little mini zine and just going through the super fast rudimentary steps of just basic storytelling because most of my storytelling knowledge is you know from Gabe just talking to him about how the fuck do I make a story he's like hey do Journey June and you'll figure it out easy and I'm like yeah I finished it but I'm still confused <laughs> That's kind of weird. It's it's uh, the Pizza Man actually did give me a good idea for you know potential ongoing series. So I do like that. So let me ask this: Do you do the drawings or do you try to parse out the story first? Uh, currently, I've been parsing out the story and the script. Like mm -hmm. uh, I follow uh, at the moment, I'm following this. Uh, yeah, you know about Dan Harmon's story circle, right? Where he frequently talks about uh, you know, the general story circle that most stories go through. Like, you know, the hero's journey and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, so I've just mostly been trying to morph a general plot towards that direction at the moment. So, so far it's, it's interesting because I'm able to get down outlines but now the new challenge is just the more nuanced stuff like figuring out dialogue like actually making distinct voices is now my new 
writing challenge. And I've, I've heard that about actually having to make the voices of the character in your head before you like come up with like their specific dialogue. Oh yeah, definitely. Now, just while we're just taking a look at your stream at, at your drawing. So what do you do the um, normal, what do you do the um, sketch drawing first and then you bring it to the computer? Uh, well, for this one, yes. Cause uh, you know, I'm yeah, these sketches specifically, these were, I was drawing in my kitchen cause I had the line ideas for a while. Cause uh, initially I had a, uh, let me just show the other side. Let me just drop the sub view with this. Cause let's see. Pop it open. Here. All right, sub view. So I drew this a while ago because I was pretty much in that world building phase of my personal comic, well now turned game. And these were the rulers of the big cat kingdom. Like, you know, every freaking cat in one kingdom because they're cats and they're dicks like that. And so, you know, Lion and Lion Queen or King and Queen of the Lion Kingdom. And I kind of just wanted to make a wacky dynamic where, you know, the queen is the competent, do everything. I have to do everything while you sit on your lazy ass and do absolutely nothing. So... I think there would be some really funny interactions going on with that. And then, you know, slowly and steadily, I'm kind of just building up and figure out, okay, what is this world going to be about? And funnily enough, that sketch, this is a digital sketch. This, uh, this sketch is all digital. Like I use my tablet for this sketch, but these sketches, these sketches were, these sketches are pencil sketches. Like I drew it on paper, then scanned it then, you know, put them together. Like, it's not actually wide like that. Um, this one, too. This one, these are just initially pencil sketches. And, you know, I refined them a little more. Actually, I did do a little bit of digital doctoring, but you probably can't tell because, you know, I really like some of the brushes. There are a few really good digital brushes. So, but... what are you using? Flip Art Studio? So yeah, I'm uh, currently using a program called Clip Studio Paint, and I personally think it's better than Photoshop. Like, holy shit, it's better than Photoshop, it's cheaper than Photoshop, there's way more functions than Photoshop, and especially for me, it's built for making comics a lot better than Photoshop. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some things that are kind of, I'd say, nitpicky, like... Um, Ironically, it can't do lettering that well. Like, I still would go to Illustrator if I'm doing lettering. But, excuse me, so sorry. But in terms of like making panels, organizing your files so that they're ready to export into pages, and, well, generally, I like how it handles its brush settings and things like that. Like, this is the most comfortable I've ever been working digitally ever like in the 10 years i've ever drawn and in the i'd say no in the 10 years i've ever drawn digitally like i've been drawing in general for i guess all my life but in terms of drawing digitally i've only been doing it for i'd say 10 years probably like 14 years if you count college but yeah um May having a like Cintiq screen tablet helps a lot too, because I only got my Cintiq last year, so I've been rocking this, and you know it's been actually pretty good with uh, the Cintiq and Clipsio Paint in general was just it's really good. I'm also using brushes that I purchased called uh, Frendin brushes. They're from an artist called Frendin, so I just refer to them as the uh, Frendin brushes. And let me just drop a link to for everyone to kind of just buy the brushes and kind of just shill for everyone here. Now, see, I will say this. I actually am using mostly traditional because I have very little commission, so 
I have to use traditional. And oh, that's drop totally the fine. link in in the 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 Zoom chat so I can actually put it on mine as well. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna drop it in here. Yeah, I actually need to like make a blog post and you know a blog post on my personal website to kind of just say, oh hey, here's where all here's pretty much all of my all of the tools that I'm currently using right now. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Ah, Mouse says uh flyland brushes are good too. Okay. I'll give that a look. Flyland brushes. So I'll probably just look that up too. Flyland brushes. Flyland see, brushes. What I actually use, I use traditional. I but I've gone the way of mostly doing um acetone markers. Mm. And I, uh, are those I Copics like, or is, are those slightly different? Oh, oh, oh no. I use the Wal the not Walmart, the Michael's brand, Artist Law. Ah, okay. They have a brand that they're that they're dis that they discontinued, which mm. are really fucking good. Unfortunately, it's very very hard to find. Because originally they were about two hundred dollars. They were like copic prices, but no one bought them. Oh shit. And so the ones that were originally like fifty bot fifty bucks, I'm getting them for I wanna say twenty. Hmm. Well, I uh I bought my Copics piecemeal because I started buying I started by uh buying five Copic gray markers at uh on Amazon. And then I slowly and steadily started just building my colors all piecemeal. And slowly and steadily, I just built up, I'd say, a collection of... I haven't counted them all, actually, but I'm going to assume it's probably 20 or so markers because I got five neutral grays, five warm grays, five cool grays, and I believe... I think another 10 colored ones, like full colored ones. And then I built up an assortment of actual, <laughs> actual like select colors and stuff like that. Hey King Sus, how's it going? Yeah, I'm just chatting a little, so don't mind me. But yeah, uh, you know, with Copics, it's interesting because I do like, uh, that I can refill them. That's probably my number one favorite thing about Copics is that I can just refill them whenever I want. But thing is, you gotta really take care of them because they can dry out easily. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they're alcohol markers, so, you know, they can go out pretty easy. Um, I haven't used, I've used uh, Prismacolor markers actually before. Like, uh, my art school gave them out by default for like an absorbently expensive price because my school was a for-profit hellhole. And yeah, yeah, I didn't think we were gonna start talking about politics this early in this in, the, in this early in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> I think in general, I think it's more of a just me griping about college in general. I'd say, but yeah, uh, the other art supplies, it's mainly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I still work traditionally whenever I'm away from my tablet or I'm traveling. And what I'm doing, I use, uh, I use, uh, brush pens, like, uh, the Pentel pocket brush. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one thing that I use for just general inking. Sometimes, yeah, just general inking. I moved on to working with, uh, actual sable brushes for just full-on inking comics when I still ink comics traditionally <laughs> i've actually i actually haven't worked traditionally in comics in a month so far so that's kind of been interesting uh, another thing let's see i have a whole bunch of pencils like i have a bunch of you know mechanical pencils i have like this the uh pentel what are they called the pentel um let me go look at my pencil real quick so yeah, Pentel Graph Gear pencils right here. Oh, you probably can't see. 
<laughs> no, because I'm only seeing your screen. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, King Sus wants to know like who's that other who's on the other side of my stream. So I guess you can just reintroduce yourself for everyone on my stream and anyone who's just joining the, the uh, stream right now. Well, I am Crimson Six Hundred Six Two Zero. I'm an artist myself. I've been drawn for about twenty years now, but serious over the last five years. I also am a YouTuber, a streamer, a political commentary, and part-time, you know, megalomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> part-time megalomaniac. You yeah, can't really be a megalomaniac part-time, really. Like that that's impossible to do, I'd say. But when you win their hearts and minds, you're always working. Oh boy. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, so somewhat a philosopher. Really? I always call that overthinking. You would be right. I think one of my <laughs> quotes, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, Soren Kierkegaard, um, but he was an absurdist. But he was like, you can do or don't do, married, get married, kill yourself or don't kill yourself. The question is, whatever you do, you're going to regret it. The key of philosophy is to just find out why. So I live my life by that principle. Mm. Now, my question, my question is, what was that initial push to make you start actually putting more of your work out? Because I'm steady trying to spark that with a lot of people who are just like, look, you have great talent. Let people know. So... So I think the initial giant push that actually pushed me towards actually doing conventions and all that stuff was, um, so, uh, when I was, uh, showing off my portfolio and stuff like that, like I was working on my first comic, Shirley's Day, and it took me like five years cause, you know, I'd never made a comic ever. And while I was working on the comic, I was pretty much going to conventions because my mom's friend told me that I need to, you know, stop. Well, I wouldn't say stop moping, but I mope so much that, you know, she has a family friend, or actually she's a co-worker, and she goes to comic cons. Like, she, uh, her comic friend goes to, like, C2E2 pretty frequently, and she was just constantly nudging me to go out to C2E2 and meet up and socialize and stuff like that. I was like, nah. Oh, no, wait, no. Before C2E2, before C2E2, there was actually a smaller library con called uh, the uh, Galaxy Comics and Fantasy Art Expo. Sorry about that. I'm confusing my timelines, actually. But they're both relevant. So, yeah. I showed my portfolio to a guy named uh, Mikey Babinski. And, you know, he totally dug my pencil art. Like, he was really excited about my penciling. All right, see ya, Mouse. Great uh, stopping by. But, uh, yeah, I... <laughs> so I showed my portfolio to him, and you now he was just explaining, you know, how... He was just telling me, hey, you should make an actual comic, you know? You should continue this and, you know, just use these characters that you have in your portfolios and sketchbooks to actually make a comic. I think your cartoon style would really work. I was like, okay. And I never really paid too much mind until I'd say a month later, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact timeline after that. But I'd say I started working on Shirley's Day I'd say in that same year that I met Mike, B Mikey Babinski. So I believe I was work i was pencil drawing it and then c2e2 was coming up and my family friend was telling me hey you we should stop by c2e2 and hang out and i was like uh okay i guess i don't know why i i nervous about going to c2e2 but you know i decided to go because you know at least i could show my portfolio again like i did a galaxy it's a tough way it's tough to get all the way out to c2e2 because you know it's all the way in chicago but i took a train to 
to get there mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I actually got there. Well, I, I don't think you can really go to a convention, late, but you know, I got there <laughs> later than I wanted to because I was still trying to figure out how to get to McCormick Place from Joliet, and you know, I had to like take the train to like the Sox Stadium, then take like Green Line to McCormick. Yeah, it's a lot easier now. It's a lot easier now. Oh yeah. Yeah, actually, you can take the train to Union Station, hmm. and then take the Metro Electric, okay. and you're there. Yeah, no. ask me how I know. Yeah, yeah, the bad just it's been around. Now, um, and that kind of mirrors the story I was telling. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I went there. Like, yeah, it was like, dude, you have good art. It was like, no, nah, I don't really don't have good art. Um, my next question is. If why do you do the art? I'm gonna put it like that. Why do you do it? Do you do it for money? Do you do it for fame? Do you do it simply for expression? Do you do it for all three above? Do you do it like I do it for the reason I do it to rule and change the world? I do it for the memes mostly. No. <laughs> so I think what really got me into comics was uh I read Captain Underpants like when I was a kid. Like my big influences is uh Captain Underpants. And Jeff Smith's Bone, if you like know your indie comics, like Jeff Smith's Bone is a really amazing indie comic. If you haven't read Jeff Smith's Bone, freaking read it right now. And yeah, I really like that. And I was like, I think Captain Underpants mainly showed me how to make comics because, you know, in those books, they explain how you make comics and how you make like flip books too so it was just really cool with captain underpants and when i was a kid uh, me and my friend made a bunch of these flip books inspired by captain underpants so this and is a quick side note were you disappointed with the movie that they came out with i actually still haven't seen that movie actually i haven't seen it i know it, it's on know netflix but i still haven't seen it yet but you know i'm i'm i know they probably won't be but I was, I am hopeful for it because it's animated, and that's that's probably my biggest litmus test for just being hopeful is it's freaking animated, so it's bound to at least not suck that badly. <laughs> that's that's the bare minimum I'd say. Like if you take a cartoon thing and at least animate it, it's going to suck much much less than if you just did a freaking live action thing and you're trying to like explain the retard logic of a cartoon thing because that's never going to work like with the superhero stuff it's still kind of disappointing because they pretty much have to nerf them really badly for them to actually work in live action yeah like they have to make Thor seem more like an alien and more Norse god. Like, I do really dig more god characters. Like, it did, like, a lot of the Marvel stuff, you know, even if it's completely inaccurate, it did get me into movies. Like, watching the Spider-Man cartoons and watching the movies did get me into reading Spider-Man comics. I mean, so, but you gotta remember, they're doing more of the um, 1610 universe than the 1610. Yeah, the six one six. So, and it's not even it's not even sixteen ten. It's just like probably like sixteen twelve. <laughs> like the the MCU is like sixteen twelve. Oh yeah. However, the new Spider Man move, the Spider Man PS Four game, and the Avengers game are actually supposed to be in the same universe, share the same universe. Oh really? Yeah, because hmm. um, it's even a comment that he makes. He's like, yeah, I heard the Avengers. This is the Avengers Tower. Like. In, PS4 Spider Man. Um, I heard this is Avengers Tower. I heard they're in San Francisco right now, which mm. is a reference to the Square game. Okay. Which is but, odd because it's, well, actually, no, it's Sony slightly. But it's, mm. it was kind of weird to me. That's a weird thing. That's a, This is the first I'm hearing of this, actually. Yeah. All of the Marvel video games, like the new era of Marvel video games, is working in the same universe. Hmm. Now, this 
I like the blue. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm thinking out loud here. So don't mind. No, no worries. No worries. That's the benefit of having digital because once I commit to um, a color, I'm committed to that motherfucking color. But um, one of the things that um, I dislike about the new Avengers game that's coming up is all of the, it just seems like a microtransaction hell coming up. Oh yeah, yeah, it does look like it's, like I saw those alternate costumes, I was like, no, Ugh, it looks, it looks awful. And you telling me that Spider-Man's also supposed to be in that universe, I'm like, really? Because That's why Sony yeah. is getting Spider-Man. That's why Sony is getting Spider-Man. Oh. Oh, that's why they're fighting over it. Oh, well. Yeah, it's a weird thing with that. But yeah, I mean, I don't have a PlayStation, so this sort of doesn't really affect me that much. Like, I, I want to play it because it looks really good. Especially like that normal Spider-Man because they're pretty much just adapting wacky Arkham combat in there. And they're making it make a little more sense than just Batman, because <laughs> the spider sense makes a lot more sense than just Batman suddenly knows that a criminal's hitting him with a pipe, or a criminal's suddenly gonna shoot him. Like at least Spider-Man has, you know, that sixth sense. Like he's practically, you know, he can see the future. Clairvoyant, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so with well, Batman's like it's. Batman wins because he's Batman. <laughs> so let me ask, Marvel or DC, what's, what's your favorite? Um, That's actually a tougher call for me because I actually grew up with the DC cartoons. I really mm -hmm. like the DC cartoons, like the Bruce Timm stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember the 90s radioactive spider blood. I dug that. <laughs> and you know, they, they are the first shared universe. Because everything that the '90s Marvel cartoons did were all one shared universe. Oh yeah, even that's all, very true. Because yeah, even like the only time because even the latest I think they went is when they had that first Avengers cartoon. Hmm. Oh yeah, there was an Avengers cartoon actually. Yeah, there was an that, Avengers cartoon. There was a Fantastic Four cartoon. There was an Iron Man cartoon. There was a Hulk cartoon. Yes. I think they were saying that they want a Thor cartoon, but I don't know if they, their anything went forward with that. Um, there was a, I know Ghost Silver Rider Surfer. showed up in, I know they Ghost. Had, they even had Silver Surfer because he spawned off after, like, Galactus was pissed off at him after the Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I do. Yeah, he crossed. Yeah, and then obviously X Men. My God, I forgot about the X Men. I am. <laughs> oh God, I'm falling for that like, like freaking Disney propaganda. Because I'm like, huh, I've completely forgotten about the X Men. But nobody should forget about the X Men. The reason you're forgetting about the X Men is because they don't want you to remember the X Men. But you know what? The thing about it is with that X Men cartoon. Like I saw the interviews behind it. And it was like, yeah, we kind of. We like they are simultaneously a good reason of how they did the cartoon to save money by doing the recaps. Mm -hmm. But like shows like and I'm gonna say it, shows like Naruto kind of takes that recap thing to the whole next level. Oh yeah. <laughs> but like it was a cost saving measure by doing previously on X Men, and they had good long storylines. Um. What was another um like the Iron Man the Iron Man show was actually awful. Um mm -hmm. and I, I think that was right when Marvel was trying to uh rebound from the bankruptcy. Um but let's oh, be yeah, honest. That bankruptcy, yeah. If if DC wasn't owned by Warner Brothers, they would have been bankrupted too. Yeah, that's very true. Like the nineties seemed like a real shit show, I'd say. It's kind of funny because I, uh, the first time I, well, I'd say the second time I was taking up X Men was I was reading, uh, Chris Claremont's, like, giant freaking X Men run, uh, in, like, those black and white essential X Men comics. I don't know if you know about, like, those big, 
fat black and white phone book size comic collections where it pretty much just collects giant freaking comic runs mm -hmm. of you know the entire thing like i i personally think it's the best thing they've ever done because you know it's all there and you don't even have to hunt for it like i wish they i wish more i wish they i wish people kept doing that actually just making those big old essential the essential x-men or the essential spider-man like even up to the modern stuff because you know it's I think at the time, I was way more used to graphic novels than the floppies. Like, even to this day, I hate reading floppies, even though I freaking sell floppies. Buy my comics, kids. But, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, prefer make, I prefer graphic novels in general because it's all there. It's all collected. I don't have to hunt for them and guess and deal with a whole list and risk tearing them i think that was probably my biggest thing is just risking tearing them it probably was a non-issue but i still so, just felt like oh man i'll tear this if i let this go so i i get exactly what you're saying like in the 90s the reason why we had so the comic bust is because of the speculation bubble versus right. actually versus actually like the trade comic books where they would actually get that whole story arc yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, trade comic books, indie comics, like, again, Bone and, uh, what's it called? Um, the Mask and, you know, the birth of Image Comics and stuff like that. Like, a lot of indie comics are just getting bigger because yeah. of the 90s and stuff like that. Milestone. Like Johnny, the, Johnny the Homicidal. Yeah, Milestone and all that stuff. You were seeing Static Shock showing up. Static Shock, Icon. There's also this uh, other girl. She was like more of a jetpack girl. She was pretty cool. I forget her name though. One of the things that I, th I bet Marvel wish they wouldn't have had it done because Static Shock would be awesome in the Marvel Universe, but they turned them down. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, now shit. Mouse was originally supposed to go to Marvel. He was supposed mm. to be a mutant. But, you know. <laughs> well, that is a mind. That's pretty fucking mind blowing, I'd say. Um, what is another one? And um, yeah, it's just like when you look at the like I I gotta admit um, when I don't read comics like physical copies, I may go on different sites and like read them or just watch the YouTube re retelling through different people's perspective um, because you could like for example. I watch Comics Explained, but I also watch Delta Deal okay. and Comic Story because, like, each one of them miss out parts. But I also may Distress. go to different um, sites that may not exactly be um, authorized to, like, do things like read manga. Okay. Yeah, now, yeah. Another reason why I'm so used to, like having those collected things was because also at the time I read a lot of manga mostly like you know I was reading early Naruto I was reading like early Dragon Ball I was reading like Gintama and Death Note and stuff like that I think Gintama actually showed up a little later but whatever like I'm, I was just reading manga more often than you know, I'm not gonna be ashamed to admit I actually read the whole thing of Salem on my oh yeah and it was a lot better than the TV shows in the 90s. Oh, yeah. I've actually been interested in just actually catching up and watching Sailor Moon and Inuyasha and all the other quote-unquote girly mangas. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, okay, it was there. People did really like it. And I think I'm old enough to not give a hell about cringy manga because there's way worse shit out so, there. Like, you know, I, I, was, I did not know the woman who wrote Sailor Moon and the man who wrote um, Yu Yu Hakusho are like married. Oh yeah, yeah. I also remember the, um, what's his name? The One Piece artist, he married a cosplayer. Like a very notable cosplayer. Probably like a, well, the Japanese cosplayer. I, I, I don't know, it's kind of like one of those interesting deals. But yeah, um, yeah, it's really interesting. 
I also remember. Now, what is it? I also remember like hearing that. Uh, I don't know if you know about the newest, the newest Netflix anime called B Stars. It's like pretty much just a new furry anime. But yeah, uh, apparently the you're talking about the you're talking about the Netflix anime that's going to spawn a whole bunch of furries like yeah, Sonic pretty much. and like Lola Bunny from. Um, from uh, Space Jam? Yeah, I still haven't seen it, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of my friends are kind of, like, constantly talking about it, telling me, hey, you should read it. I'm like, I'll read it later. <laughs> and I'll watch it later. It's like hanging on my Netflix, like, yeah, you'll watch it, but I want to watch Killer Clowns from Outer Space instead. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, the uh, artist who made uh, the Beastars manga, apparently she's also the darter of the artist who made uh baki the grappler and it's like this super it's this super battle manga ass battle manga like it goes through all the elaborate steps of actual fighting like like if you like before. fighting and really good functional muscles like he emphasizes muscles for proper function like he gives a lot of fuck about muscles with like Baki the Grappler. Like he even goes through like the logic of, oh hey, if you're big and if you're uh if you're scrawny and abby, that's mostly just aesthetic muscles. You're better off being like wide and fatter because you're more of a weightlifter and that's gonna help you function. You'll have a better core that way. And he like goes through stuff like that. I'm like, wow, this is nuts. So that's also on my wacky list of, you know, read it now, because, you know, this is really good. Yeah, see, when what really got me started into, like, manga is actually this anime. I remember, um, oh, yeah, I don't definitely. know if you were, I don't know if you're, you're, I, yeah, uh, I, I didn't Tsunami ask you how old you were. Like that. No, 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 oh, I don't really? know how old you are. But there was a show called Japanimation that used to come on Chicago Channel 62. Hmm. And they used to show some of the darkest anime there was. Now they censored it out. Um, like which Doomed Metropolis. Metrop oh, Metropolis. Doomed, oh, shit. No, Doomed Metropolis. Huh. Never heard of that one. Or um, what was what was another one? Vampire Hunter D. Oh, shit. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. And it would come on like at 11 o'clock at night, like on a Saturday night, and they would just show a two hour block. That's fucking rad. Like, have you have you ever seen like the actual original novel of Vampire Hunter D with like the illustrations by uh, Yoshitaka Amano, the uh, Final Fantasy artist? It's really good. No. It's like, it's, well, basically, you know, it's about a that sent. I think it's like a vampire bounty hunter in a way, I think. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know he's, looks he's really a, good. It's Alucard, basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny because like, I think Helsing kind of like ripped that off. <laughs> well, because uh, you got to remember, it's it's like it's either Dracula, either it's Alucard is either his son or like a weaker form of Dracula. Yeah. Like, look, look, look at Castlevania. Oh yeah. Um, and it's and I've heard that in other places before. Um, it's just like anime has a weird fascination with Dragon. Oh, yeah, he's vampires like, are cool. <laughs> exactly, and the Western vampires are cool versus like the Eastern vampires. Yeah, Eastern vampires—they just suck people's anuses. They're that cool. <laughs> I think it's pronounced for us, but yeah. <laughs> now. Another one that they showed, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wicked City. Yep, I haven't. Um, of course, um, we have all the classic animes that they showed. Like, they showed us a few movies of Evangelion. Oh, um, yeah, I've never seen Evangelion ever. And I hear, like, that's the gigantic, everybody should watch Evangelion type of thing. And I'm like, yeah, if I can actually find it. It's on Netflix. Oh, it is. But here, like, yes. it's not the complete thing. No, it's on Netflix, and they do the end of Evangelion. Oh, okay. And um, what was another one? Um, of course, like the cheesy um, harem anime Tenchi Moto. 
I oh, fucking yeah, I love the one. original one. Not 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 the universe or not the Tenchi in love. But the original Tenchi Moto where he was like space Jesus, like next god of the universe. And everybody was related to him and everybody like gushed over him. Mm. Both figuratively and literally. <laughs> And then I, I got, they have vague memories about Tenchi Muyo. Have yeah. super vague memories. Um, what are some other animes that I watch? Like I used to watch stuff like Tri-Blood, um, Trigun. <coughs> some of those more fantasy type things, but futuristic almost. Um, like animes now, like I know I like watch like some of the trash animes or what the sophisticated people call trash anime, like Sword Art on online. Yeah, it's not a bad Sword Art. So. It's not a bad anime. Mm. It could be better in places. Um, of course, I watched Naruto, both yeah. the original and Shippuden. I actually it's kind of interesting Naruto. because I did want to reread that manga because I hear like. It ends in a way, because I think I stopped reading, I think I stopped, well, just consuming Naruto ever since, I think it stops showing up on Toonami, I think. Because I think the last time I saw Naruto was the near end of the tuning exam, like just when Sasuke disappeared. Oh, you didn't go into the Shukumi time frame. Oh, yeah. I feel bad. Yeah, for so you. I was like playing catch up with that. So, like recently, I was like, okay, I'm gonna read the Naruto manga and see if I can't find Bleach in the library because I want to see how that train crashes. Oh shit! Like, I need to save real quick. <laughs> wait, yeah, my wait, wait, wait! Nearly crash. How far did you get into Bleach? <sighs> uh, I was in the very, very beginning of Bleach. Like. Oh, I wow. Think, <laughs> I think the first time, uh, what's his name? Chad or whatever his name is. The, uh, like that muscle guy. Oh, like, I wow. know later on he gets like this arm or whatever, but it was still super early. Like, I think it was just when, uh, what's his name? Ichigo finds out Rukia was taken back to Soul Society for her trial. Like, I'm oh, in the wow. very, very beginning of Bleach. And I, again, I lost track of Bleach. And I was like, okay, I should catch back on Bleach because it ends terribly. So I want to see exactly why. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't end bad, and they're going to bring it up. But the thing about it, they bring up the end. But the thing about it is, as you know with fans, anybody that has fans, hmm. they want something new. But the same thing. Yeah. And I always heard that like the manga cop was just constantly fighting with his editor. Like he was just constantly fighting with them. And he constantly was getting sick because of the basically the work. Oh yeah. Um yeah, not yeah. everybody can be a Toriyama. Oh yeah. And even Toriyama was kind of just bullshitting his way to victory, really. But you gotta remember, Toriyama would like the if that when the mangas used to come out every week, he would wait till the last two days and push shit out. Yeah, exactly. He is amazing at bullshitting his way to victory. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people obviously crap on his writing, but I sort of commend that a little <laughs> as like one artist to another because it's like, <laughs> you know, I. Sometimes I do, sometimes I do feel like, man, if I could, I, you know, I'm a mass, I'm a massive perfectionist myself and Toriyama does not give a fuck. He was like, he'll like fucking draw right in there and he'll just do it because time is money. Like he, he will get it done and it still looks and half decent and that like. You know. the, the famous Super Saiyan story. Oh, yeah. What color are you going to make his hair? I don't know. Blonde, because we don't have time to ink it. 
<laughs> See, it's, it's like, like quick thinking like that makes freaking genius iconic things like that. Sure, it ends up just getting abused and dumb, but... <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like, oh, oh, I got a great idea. Let's show how, how strong these people are about power levels. And then, like, two issues later, we totally throw that shit out the window. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because oh, he just had deadlines, and his editor was like, hey, how can we make the kids like... How can we make the kids like Dragon Ball? I don't know, power levels, I guess. And he's like, no. yeah. <laughs> Favorite part, like, I got tired of drawing his tail, so I just made him lose it. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, oh, I got really funny. I wanted to draw a better fight scene, so I made him an adult. Wait, what? But he has short arms. Yeah, but it, it, it just looks better if he has longer arms. So we're going to make him an adult and broke the anime cartoon whatever you want to call it, of the kids staying a kid forever. It's like, oh, no, we're just going to make you an adult, make it easier to fight. <laughs> yeah, like, his laziness breeds innovation. That's that's engineer mind. He's a freaking engineer. Like, he has the brain of an engineer. Engineers, engineers are smart. They think of smart, they think of smart solutions because they're effing lazy most of the time. That's kind of my weird mythology that I always think about when I think of engineers. Because I uh, I have a bunch of friends who kind of like do a lot of engineering type of things. Like they build stuff. And <laughs> nine times out of ten, they're usually like doing it because they don't give a fuck. <laughs> they just want to oh. do it just to do it. This guy at my job, he was like, so we're going to like his, he was in engineering class and his engineering teacher actually said um um his engineering teacher was like hey drop an egg off of like a certain floor in a john hancock building right so everybody could try to come up with these elaborated ways of the egg not crashing you know what he did they do built the parachute <laughs> <laughs> just built a parachute like Fuck like <laughs> Like, it's you. not stupid if it works. <laughs> that that is the that is the motto that I need to follow. That is that's Buddhist monk level like calmness. Like it's not stupid if it works. And I wish I wasn't as like that's the kind of innovation in I'd say intelligence that I hope to aspire to. Cause I kinda wanna be a little more fast and loose with myself like in general like life stuff and all that stuff and you know you just have these i'd say you're just seeing all these guys just able to have their shit together mainly because they give slightly less of a fuck than the next guy you know so <laughs> it's kind of funny with that what is the phrase, fail faster? Yeah, exactly. Sh- like, get, these guys are really wrong. good at failing fast. Because they don't have time to actually care who <laughs> thinks of them. Now, see, we've been on stream for the last, what, hour or so? And this looks fucking awesome, man. Oh, I am looking at your screen, and it looks fucking awesome. It's much. Yeah, so far so good. Yeah, these days I've been trying to get more into working off my actual pencils because mm-hmm. I've been I've been I've been looking at a bunch of other artists and you know they have really really clean line art. I'm like, okay, I want I want to at least have some better line art for my art because you know I you know I feel self conscious about it so. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm like constantly chasing smaller and smaller lines, and you know I was like, okay, my inking's incredibly stiff. Why don't I try just drawing on the pencil itself, and see how that goes, and just belt it out real quickly. And yeah, so far some people have been thinking positively about this, like or at least receiving it more positively, and. 
you know, I'm continuing it with some of my stuff. I'm still like doing some experiment stuff. There's still a few things that I'll still ink, like this one I'm currently working on, because this was actually traditionally. And uh, this big commission, this was actually, I'm inking this, but I'm using gray lines for this actually. Like I'm yeah, I see. Gray, so it's not just a complete black line. And so, what I've actually done because I'm still using traditional is I'm like incredibly cheap. So what I actually did was go to the dollar store, get the four four dollar mechanical pencils, get their little drawing paper, hmm. do my sketching on that, and I have a light pad. Hmm. which I translate all my sketch once I get it done to uh, either a Bristol or mixed media. Mostly do, does Bristol, mostly do Bristol. And I have clean lines. And when I'm actually, cause like I hate the hard black lines myself Yeah. because using acetone markers and you've known this from using Copics, if you get it just right, it can look as if you're using watercolor. <clears throat> mm. Oh yeah. Especially if you blend it really well. And that's one of my strong suits. It can look almost as if you're looking watercolor. Really nice. And the thing about it is I started using fine liners. Instead of actually using black markers or the 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 um what do, what do you call it? The the graphite on the the final drawing. I use fine liners hmm. to match the colors that I'm going to actually use. And this actually turned out well. I don't know about going to a digital format. If I get more resources myself, I'm going to actually go more to a digital format. But, like, man, I'm having fun using traditional. Well, you know, if you ever want to, like, try out digital, there's a tablet called the Wacom One, which is, like, it's fairly cheap. It's also their like newest, newest one, and you know it's one of their new cheaper ones. What I'm trying to find out the price of it right now, but you know it's it's not like a screen tablet, but you know it's a nice starter. You know you put it on the, you know you can draw on the thing while looking at the stream straight forward, and that's a good starter tablet. Or just... I think I know what you're wanting to talking about. Um, it's oh, yeah. probably about a hundred. Um, I did actually try to demo one, and to be honest with you, it was a size of, size of a fucking um, um, index card, and I did not have any good for. I did not have any good time for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just now, you know suggesting it because it seemed like it would be cheaper because it's like no, sixty dollars, no, and you know. No, I know the one you're talking about, um, but the one I had, it was like thirty dollars on Amazon. Ah, uh, okay. It, it was. It yeah, was the one I'm about to link to you is like, you know, let me just drop it here in the Zoom call. But yeah, this one on Amazon is like sixty dollars, like fifty nine ninety five. So you know, it's a nice cheap starter tablet i'd say i'd i'd I, I could probably recommend it because it seems like it's similar to uh some bamboo tablets because they used to have a tablet called bamboo the wacom bamboo that's how they used to you know those were the beginner starter tablets so you know when i started learning digital art i used a wacom bamboo and i forget uh gimp yeah, I used GIMP. I also used a uh, really old, well, it's not old. At the time, it wasn't old. But I used a, a, a Macromedia Flash 5 to do some of my drawing. And I used to try and animate back then with a uh, Flash 5. And, you know, it was pretty all right, but I never really, like, made anything. Or, like, I never posted anything. So I used to... Now that was pretty much the gist of my digital thing, but I was still hanging on to traditional art because I didn't understand the concept of pen pressure or brush setting and things like that. I was kind of just lost in general. 
So how much practice do you think you did with digital art before you became comfortable? Uh, I'll say five years. I'll say that much. Because I was mostly working digitally in college because all of my peers were working digitally in college and like they were able to make full-blown concept art looking art like full-blown they could paint and stuff it looked like you know concept art books from uh uncharted and things like that like it looked like that i was like oh is that what good art is i should probably get a tablet so my art can look a little better because oh, you know, kind of oh. dope, insecure and stuff like that so you know i learned how to use uh one of those um one of the intuos tablets and then later, I purchased my own Intuos, like a large ass freaking size tablet that could barely fit in my bag. Like I had to get a whole separate bag just to fit it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was working with that because I was like, okay, because I was taught in figure drawing to draw with my arm and just draw really large. So I was like, okay, I'll get a, the largest tablet I have because I was taught to draw large. And I'd say overall, it was sort of a wasted purpose, or at least in the context of now, because, you know, I don't have much space at the moment. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, I'm just looking at your style. Which, What would you say most influenced you, the Eastern style of art or Western? I'd say that's a tougher question because many people say that my art looks like Disney style and other people say that my art looks anime style. But I'd say since I consume a lot of RPGs, like a lot of my art influences is like Legend of Zelda and Nintendo games, I'd say Eastern art styles probably influences me a little more because, you know, video games are mostly in that Eastern style. So I'll just say that Eastern styles inspire me more. So what's but your favorite video game? I love Zelda. I freaking love Legend of Zelda stuff. These days, Breath of the Wild is my current favorite Zelda. But before Breath of the Wild, Ooh. I really liked... Ooh. Actually, I really liked the original Zelda one, actually. Like, it's the one game that I keep replaying. Because uh, there was a uh, there was a collection, like there was a Zelda collection back in the GameCube days, where uh, it came with a demo of Wind Waker, but it also came with Zelda One, Zelda Two, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask. Until so I was playing all those games at the same time. Like, so I will say this: Zelda One was okay. Zelda Two, I don't know what what LSD fuel trip they were on, it must have been all the cocaine they made from selling Zelda 1. But um, Link into the Past is probably my favorite. I haven't played any other ones past Link into the Past. And I'll tell you why I have an attachment to Link into the Past. Mm -hmm. So what's this magazine called? Nintendo Power. Okay. Where yeah, they I've actually seen. did, they actually did the story of Link into the Past. Oh yeah, like, uh, Tetsuya Tirada. No, yeah, yes. Tirada. Tetsuya Tirada. They also did um, Mario World as well. So they did both of them, and it was a fun. Like literally, it was it was Link and Zelda like you've never known them before. Oh yeah, and in the end, like he became the protector of the Triforce. And they broke up. Oh, that's depressing, actually. She was like, while we were going through it, you rescued me. We fell in love. But ever since, and it was like, uh, it was like a few years after they, like, won. It was like, ever since you became the wielder of the Triforce, the protector of the Triforce, you've been so distant. And we can't keep doing this, Link. And she was like, goodbye, Link. That sounds like, you know, the ending to Ocarina, too. Was, the ending of Ocarina of Time was pretty bittersweet as well. Was basically, Zelda had to send Link back to his own timeline so he could actually relive his childhood. I'd say the timeline is kind of different now because 
oh, in the context of Majora's Mask, Navi yeah. either disappeared or died. They're really vague about it. And I guess Young Link was kind of like hunting for her or something like that. It's weird. Majora's Mask is really good at being vague because when they were making Majora's Mask, they were pretty much on a fucking tight deadline and they weren't really thinking too hard about the actual details. When It's like when they try to make direct sequel, sequels to uh, Legend of Zelda, they fuck it up. Actually, they actually had a pretty good track record of it because, you know, Majora's Mask and A Link Between Worlds were pretty good. Like, the only real bad sequels. I'm not saying bad, but they don't keep the same continuity. They always should basically try to do oh yeah separate continuity. Oh, yeah I, I know it it's like um it's like it's like the mega man problem the continuity between mega man and mega man x oh yeah that well and i like, think it's a little easier to get mega man and mega man x because they th those two commute continues are so far apart from each other that they have a lot of room to kind of just bullshit their way <laughs> away from the actual details of what actually happened. Like, I was legit thinking that uh, Mega Man 10, like when they were making that, was going to actually link Mega Man X and Mega Man together, like Mega they, Man Classic and all that. Because, they you know, always obviously link. the Roman numeral, you'd think, okay, Mega Man X, Mega Man 10, they're actually going to do it. But they don't really, they kind of like, they kind of cowered out on it. Even in Mega Man 9, they kind of like suggest, oh, hey, there's the schematics for Zero. But right, nope, they, they always link with Zero, they never meant link X. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. They always link Zero. It's like, it's a theory that like, what ha was happening between Wiley and um and um Light were in this small area because all the rest of the world didn't know about robots and like really they not they, they um Zero woke up the first time he woke up and killed everybody. Hmm. Wasn't and the point of the robot masters was that they were supposed to be like service robots, so people should know about the robots. Right. And so in X's timeline they didn't. So it was like it, it may have been a thing where they were off in one part of the world hmm. and like because like when they found x it was just a total wasteland it was everything around it was dead and they they had a they had a epiphany that every zero came to life killed everybody except for mega man and mega man because of everything that happened became wild in the original game hmm. that's weird because like in the context of the like general storyline stuff like there was a few like anime movies about the about Mega Man X where it's like okay they had a civilization they had a few robots but they didn't really have really good AI robots until they found X right and zero and then right. they built like all the actual good robots like all the Mavericks and the Reploids and stuff like that or well, remember um, rock, um rock was a literal good ai rock mm. and roll they like of course rock and roll yeah um but they had good ai but like nobody else knew about it mm. some shit went down and it was probably zero zero probably came through and just wiped every fucking thing out because you got to remember zero isn't just based on pro yeah, he's yes, also based yeah, on zero wasn't yeah, Zero wasn't a robot master as Doc. Uh, yeah, Doctor. Ro I think I forget which Mega Man Zero game or whatever, but Doctor Wily did say that Zero was supposed to like be way better than any robot master because he really wanted to outdo Doctor Light with this. Yeah, he was based on Proto Man, Mega Man, and Base. Hmm. That's that's who Zero was. He was based on all three of them. And he was not fucking around. He came to he came through and just annihilated shit. That was a suspicion. He came through and just like, ah, oh, isn't that cute? You have an X but you have a you have a mega buster. Here, let me show you what a real one's about. Oh yeah. Like Zero was way more advanced in everything and 
you know, we, you know, we just, Dr. Light pretty much had to reply in kind. Like, a, the story of Mega Man is essentially two scientists having an arms war against each other. Just having a private arms war against each other. Like a private arms waste. And it's just comical. Um, so, what do you think of the current state of video games that's happening right now? I don't think about the current state of video games. <laughs> uh, that's 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 probably a weird non-answer, but that's kind of the truth. Like I'm making my own in, I'm making my own video game, and that's kind of like me saying, you know, I'm doing my own thing. Like I I have a Switch bound play it that often. Like I don't play video games often ever since I graduated college. Well, actually, I'd say even ever since I started college. I've been more satisfied drawing than actually playing video games these days. That I'll really, I don't really play video games. I still keep up with some of them though. Like I know, I I've, I've been keeping my eyes on the latest re releases and stuff like that. I still listen to game podcasts like Giant Bomb, all that stuff. But I'd say in terms of the actual game industry obviously the dlc stuff's really bad and obviously they were trying to rip off tf 2 success because valve makes money because they are really good at making hats <laughs> not only that they make money for the steam platform oh yeah now that's it's actually pretty interesting the game that you're playing that you're making um, are you going to try to put it on any of the major platforms? Uh, obviously, we're going to start on PC. And no, no, I mean, like, are you going to try to put it on Steam, Indiegogo, um, um, GOG? Um, it's likely that we're probably going to start on itch.io mm -hmm. because, you know, it's more for, you know, the more indie plucky guys. Mm -hmm. And plus, you can set it up for free for anyone who wants to. Itch.io has a more looser atmosphere than Steam, I'd mm -hmm. say. But uh, we still haven't decided yet because we're still freaking making it. We're taking it one step at a time. But I'd say we're likely going to, we're obviously gonna put on PC first because you know it's a PC game, but Obviously, since the Game Boy stack, we're gonna try and get on the Switch or whatever Nintendo console because it's a freaking Game Boy type game. It's it's tough to really like go without that Game Boy game. So that's kind of the massive hope. In terms of like other consoles, we'll see if we get development kits. You know. Well, you know, um, Nintendo right now is actually reaching out to a lot of indie studios. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, now, that's pretty much the reason why I did get a Switch was because there are so many indie studios just doing really well. There are so many games that I actually legit want to play. And, you know, plus the portability, like I could play in my car and it was really great. <laughs> well, you know, that's what actually I would say helped kick PlayStation off this generation. They didn't have any of their big budget IPs, oh, yeah. but the indies like helped fill the goal. Now, if we can only get Microsoft to want to make games instead of making like um, services, but that's yeah. a different story. Um, that yeah, kind of goes into the yeah. With X, it's weird with Xbox because Xbox doesn't make games that appeal to me at all. Nothing in <laughs> Xbox's library really appeals to me. Like they're all shooters mostly. You mean Gears, um, Halo, and yeah. Forza? Yeah, like I've played, <laughs> I played a little bit of Halo One with a friend, but you know he was kind of an asshole co-op partner who kept shooting me in the back. So you know what, Halo sucks. I don't want to play it. Uh, my See. friends tried to get me into Minecraft, but I was playing it on the PC, and I was like, eh, I don't really get the appeal. So it kind of okay. bounced off of me. Um. Forza, I've never played Forza, but I might play Forza. I I think I think I was like put off by the rumor. Well, they're not rumors, it's the real thing. Like the fact that it was more of a realistic racing game. I was like, eh, I kinda prefer the arcade style racing, so I'd probably 
I probably I I hear uh, Forza Horizons more arcadey. So it I'll is. probably see if I can't find it. See, like you... uh, whatever the Microsoft Service Store is, because I have Windows 10. So you would have hated you would have hated my favorite um, racing game, Gran Turismo. Oh, uh, Gran Turismo! I've heard of Gran Turismo. It's fucking yeah. awesome. I was the I was a crazy motherfucker that used to do the two hour races. Oh yeah. I was, I'm yeah. so used to games like a uh, Hydro Thunder and California Rush in like the bowling alley arcades and things like that, that I was like, eh, this is, you know, the other games, like, I feel like GTA has really awful driving controls. I can't stand <laughs> GTA's driving. Like, I don't know how anyone could like GTA's driving. Ironically, that's not the worst driving game that I've actually played. Really? Um, no, really, for real. I actually have a game called Far Cry. Far oh, really? Cry, yes, that, oh, yeah, that driving that, is yeah. horrible. Um, one of the things that I've actually done is like I'm I'm a big world build. I'm a big like give me Legos and I will build you a fucking world. Mm-hmm. Like I did get into Minecraft really heavy, but it was a game called Conan Exiles that I fucking love. Oh, it's oh, a Conan God. Barbarian game. Okay. And you actually can summon gods, like you can summon like the different gods in the game. Like you can summon Krom and all that stuff. No, Krom is the only one is the only god that doesn't hear prayers. <laughs> That's to hell with him. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, they had you can actually summon um um Set. Really nice. You have a giant serpent um avatar, Mithra. Um, you can uh, summon um, Daycon, which is basically hell. Like mm-hmm. you literally summon the, the you, you've seen how hell is depicted. Like um, imagine a really nice, beautiful, tall 200 foot woman mm-hmm. on one half and oh, yeah, a yeah. skeleton I, on the other. Yeah. talking about like Norse hell. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You literally summon hell. What was another one? Um, you can actually summon um, um, it's just one like flying skull with smoke coming out of it yeah mm. so um that was actually a good one um one of the games that i play a lot because i just like fucking space is elite dangerous but i just like what's killing me about gaming now is it's the new gold rush and microtransactions oh yeah it, definitely. it disgusts me yeah obviously oh yeah it's not even just the microtransactions. I think it's also just that constant arms race for graphics and stuff like that. Like with that Unreal Engine, uh, what's it, six or five? I forget. Yeah, it's five. I mean, obviously, you know, more graphics fidelity means that you know it's way easier for you know having alternate art styles. But it's kind of like nobody was... really uses it to make interesting art styles, like. I'll never see a really good impressionism game or a cubism game or anything like that. So one of the things that bothers me about the push for realism and the art, um, the fidelity of video games, it causes motherfucking game companies, and I'm gonna say it like fucking Naughty Dog or game companies like oh yeah, you crunching know, and stuff. That's another thing that also has been bothering me about game companies. No, and I think that's probably game culture in general, I'd say, is they're not allowed to shrink their scale. Like, they're mm-hmm. never given the opportunity to just shrink their scale for a bit to teach their less experienced guys, you know, to actually make their shit. Like, if it's a disappointing game, like, game players are going to be like, oh, they just sent their B team. Like, yes, they sent their B team. They sent their B team so they can become the A team. What the hell is wrong with you? And it's kind of, it's, I kind of have a little, these days I kind of give probably more of a pass to games than I'd say most game gamers would say Mm -hmm. that I should. Like in terms of like uh, Last of Us 2, I feel like, you know, I'll probably give that more of a pass because it's likely they had really shitty deadlines and they had no idea what to actually do. Like, I'm more sympathetic to the making and the development of games, because 
I used to be a game. De I used to be a game tester, and mm -hmm. these days I'm a game developer. But you know, I've inundated myself with the actual making of games, and all that experience has kind of taught me about video games way more than any game review or any time in college. I'd say and I would it's put say so much perspective to me that. I now am more likely to give even a really bad game a free pass because I'm able to think about the developers who pretty much had to crunch or listen to some manager who had no fucking clue how games were made, but they're just giving money because, oh, it's popular with the kids. My son likes it. That means every kid likes it. And da da da. But see, that's the thing. The game development, I think, is being you know at the same time written into the ground and hamstring by the game the, the 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 business part of it oh yeah definitely like i'd say that's par for the case with most businesses i'd say like if you have so many businesses overstepping their bounds and just ignoring you know ignoring people who are actually on the ground floor making their stupid thing happen mm -hmm. like that's pretty much just gonna end up being worse for everyone involved. Because basically, what it boils down to is management babying you and telling you how to do your own job that you spent years of your life training to do. And not only that, asking for impossible shit at the same time. Oh yeah. And not, not even just impossible shit. Like, asking for impossible shit and saying that they're right and that they know better than the person who has done this for way longer, for way better. And it's been a real, it's not good, I'd say. <laughs> I mean, I can't really put it shortly other than the suits really aren't good at not middle managing everything to the ground because they have too much of a vested interest and they're like, ah, but I want the money now. How come it isn't making Fortnite money yet? I want <laughs> Fortnite money. It needs to make money now. What I don't was realize, it? hey, video games take a long time. Video games are a miracle of computer programming. Like, in the grand scheme of computer programming, like in comparison to like something like software development and stuff like that, like game development is wizardry because not only, like, not only are you trying to think of things like rendering mechanics, algorithms, mechanics, noise. you're simulating physics, you're simulating enemy AI and behavior and things like that. You're doing so many math calculations. You're making the visual renderer so you'll know how the light bounces. You're trying to figure out how the colors will display on the screen. You're figuring out the screen size of things in comparison, like, and I'm probably just talking about like PC and stuff like that. You also You're have to, to factor in things like console development. Who else has their own PC settings? What kind of graphics card they're using? Yes. Minimal specs. I was about to throw in minimal specs. Yeah, the minimal, the, the what's it? The least common denominator, probably like the most, probably like the lowest common denominator, yeah. stuff like that. Like you, like people complain about, you know, graphics, kind of like not being good enough, when they're they're the ones running these four hundred dollar PCs. And they don't even realize that they're like one of 12 guys who have these $400 PC, or $4 million PCs, I'm gonna, 400, that's easy. But yeah, game developers and, you know, game makers and, you know, the people who fund this stuff, they're trying to sell to that soccer mom who wants to just buy a $200 box for their kids so they'll shut up for five minutes, you know? That's I, who they're selling to. I think when- And 
that's think, what actually makes them real money and they're not the only ones in the world you know who play video games you know because that's also another thing that most game most like big game people don't realize is that you're not the center of the earth with this what? kind of stuff there's so Wait, many people who you're telling me it's not stuff. just for me yeah it's exactly. not just for me yes <laughs> I think and what people happened. can kind of like argue that it's a shitty argument like especially the whole oh it's for it's only for kids it's not for you but well what did you expect you just suddenly showed up as an audience for something that you know they were probably not factoring in as you know i'm sure the actual devs were like yeah we should make this as high fidelity as possible but the managers of the suits are probably not even going to know or care they're like get this out because we want our money now like you know what thinking about that so there was a there is a youtuber named jim sterling and he, years ago he says management and like in actual publishers they actually think of only when they think video games they only think of three games that did tell you how long it was they think everything should be clash of plans Call of Duty or Candy Crush. Oh yeah, those are the only three games that they know. Oh yeah, and they would like, why isn't it making this much money? It like, and what pisses me off, especially about the microtransactions, like Activision, Active fucking Vision, fuck them. Oh, we made record profits this quarter, and here we're laying off eight hundred workers. Oh yeah, that's a real crap show. And the worst part is, it's very difficult to kind of just do something. Because yeah, you can boycott it, but the guy who just wants the next Madden's not going to know or care. They just want the next Madden or they want the next FIFA. Like, it's the next roster update. Yeah, like they might they might like complain a little about, "Oh hey, this roster Kind of like cost me a lot of money. How come my FIFA bucks aren't working? But you know, it's really difficult to just convince the guy who just buys a sports game every year because he just wants to relax from work to not buy it and to spend the money on something else like Netflix or something. Because you know they're they're not athletic enough to play the actual sport themselves. And, you know, they're not gonna just, there's not gonna be a sports game on every day. Like, even LeBron James needs to rest every once in a while. So there, oh. there can't be constant sports every day. So, you know, what's the So guy you're telling do? me, <laughs> you're telling me that, you're telling me that, 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 that people waste just as much time watching sports sports games as they would complain about somebody who plays video games oh, what yeah. what no no sports are are more reputable to watch that all day versus playing video games <laughs> because reasons no 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 actually it's watching people play video games that's not <laughs> as that's not as <laughs> reputable <laughs> say it's the twitch streamer yeah oh god oh yeah I remember that. I remember that freaking controversy with Ninja, like complaining about the sports ball. <laughs> why don't they just kick it good? I don't know. Why don't you shoot the Fortnite gun? <laughs> why don't you shoot? Why don't you shoot your gun better, Ninja? Why don't you like shoot it? Why don't you shoot more accurately? I watched the sports. Oh look, he kicked a a strike. <laughs> No, it's a field goal. Like I think he was complaining about like field goal kickers. Oh yeah, I I I'll admit that I was used I used to be like that too until I tried football in high school. And, you know, I became friends with a kicker, and you know he kind of explained to me how it actually works. And it's actually fucking hard to kick a football, even like twenty yards and stuff like that, because. One, you gotta kick it right so it doesn't freaking 
spin and wobble all over the place. Exactly. And two, you gotta factor in the wind and the weather. So that's a whole nother thing. Plus, if you're in an actual game, you have to factor in the motherfucker who's trying to block your kick. So that's a whole nother thing that you gotta deal with. Or and the crowd that's trying kicker. to miss, that's trying to throw off the count so you can miss the snap. Oh yeah. So yeah, kicking like, you know, most other jobs is obviously a job. Even art obviously is a job, even though nobody wants to pay for it. But it is a harder job than people think. It's not simply just painting pretty colors and dreaming about destiny and all the forces of the universe. It's <laughs> figuring out you're when you're an artist, you have to study history. You have to study visual physics, like visual light and stuff like that. Like you have to you kind of have to know practically everything to be able to draw it because it actually takes a surprising amount of discipline to get really good with drawing because essentially you're probably like especially if you're making comics and stuff like that you're your own fashion designer you're <laughs> your own like you're you're, <laughs> you're your own historian you're your own <laughs> you're your own like scientists and physicists because you have to study visual light that's a physics thing you're your own photographer because photography is also a whole different discipline like you have to be able to study light and exposure and things like that you'll probably have to be your own florist if you're drawing landscapes and making them up as you go you'll probably have to do a little bit of architecture and if you're oh, wow. making a comic about certain subjects you probably will need to do the basic research and just how to do certain subjects, like especially guns. People are anal retentive about movies and comics that just have really bad gun play and trigger discipline and stuff like that. Guns you know the funny and swords thing of, and all that stuff. Yeah. The funny thing about it is when you was listening to that shit, while I'm going through my head thinking like, wait a minute, I had to learn this shit. I had to learn that shit. Yeah. Right. right? And I'm like, and the funniest thing about it, like I like I it's a video on my YouTube channel where I literally go in and I try to um somebody do a commission and I was one of those people that, you know, this was actually recent. I didn't require a down payment for a commission. So I did the work before I actually did it. I did a line. I was like, hey, how's this? I got to go ahead and go. When it came to payment, oh, this doesn't look right. I don't like this style. <laughs> Wait, what? I, the, the style that I have out here, literally, this is this is the style that you saw my simple drawings were. Yeah, but I don't like the cartoony style. Excuse me? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh... and so, like I was like I actually still have a picture. So a couple of weeks go by. Well, I talked to my painter, and um, they said that um, they can use that to do the painting. Cool beans. But before they do that, could you fix the nose? No, nah, pay me pay pay me half of the cost. What? But you know what? Now that I look at it, the eyes are off. Yeah. Uh huh. You thought you were gonna get a free picture. Nah, that that's not how we play. Oh yeah. And man, like people I people value art but don't want to spend money for it. Oh yeah. It's like the video game thing. Why don't they just do it for the love of the art? Because love of the art can't pay a fucking bill. Yes. Passion does not pay my bills, my dude. <laughs> so you need to pay me because I'm out of money and I need to pay rent and my landlord will break my knees. Well, I don't have a to live with my parents, whatever. But yeah, like as much, like I think the perception is, the perception that arts are just kids making pretty pictures is I think that's also another thing that's probably kind of, I don't know if I could say ruining the art world, but kind of just mm -hmm. 
messing it up for more artists is that you have a lot of these teenagers who are doing commissions for pennies right because well even 20 bucks is a lot of money for a teenager with no money or house or kids or bills to pay mm -hmm. that like they don't have any expenses but if an adult wanted to pretty much take commissions and things like that they would have to significantly lower their prices and double their work and to double right. their workload because people are used to the cheaper prices from you know those teenagers and stuff like that because they don't know the proper you know they don't know the proper rates of that stuff then you combine that with international artists exactly. who have the cheaper cost of living out there and since the US dollar is worth a lot more compared to their like you know I guess like say uh you know Mexico and stuff like that like mm -hmm. the Mexican peso and things like that since it fluctuates so much I don't know if it still fluctuates but you know the US dollar is worth way more than the peso and so you know a Mexican artist will get way more money even though it's less money in the US it's like way more money in Mexico so I mean like I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you if I had like my ultimate dream I would destroy the market for artists and the reason why I say that because my ultimate dream is to have people be more expressive and bring their creation to the forefront mm. where it art is valuable i'm not gonna lie but i want people to stop seeing art as this ivory tower but then in my perfect world we would have socialism where you would have basic needs as a right so i don't know if that's like you know what i mean like yeah you want to like have that uh ubi and stuff like that well, not even a UBI. Like, oh, really? We all know humans need housing. We all know humans need food. Yes. Why do we live in a world where we have enough food and housing to house and feed everyone, mm -hmm. but half the world is starving and homeless? Oh, yeah. That's a big thing. So, like, yeah. Like, um, my realistic goal is I actually want to do a kind of an artly uh where i would actually if i if somebody gave me like a windfall of three to t uh, three to ten million dollars i would literally buy a studio where i would allow for people to come in not even rent it but like a community studio it was like hey you need to work on art this is your studio you just bring your own supplies well it's not like it doesn't exist like uh there's a uh, what's it water street studio out in uh, chicago Wait, no. Well, yes. No, it's a uh, Powell and Chisel out in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they kind of just do that. They have like their own mm, uh, figure drawing sessions. Plus they have gallery shows and things like that. So they sort of do that in a way. Like the uh, person there, he kind of does that for, you know, you know his stuff. And uh, I know about a Wall Street series, but I think that's more of a gallery than an actual art collection, art league, stuff like that. But you know, it, it does exist, so it's not impossible to do. Right, right. Um, but just thing. a matter of just, I'd say either A, getting the pet patrons and stuff, well, not just patrons, but just getting people to, you know, fund it. Because obviously we're not gonna have that socialist system for a long while so <laughs> we kind of have to bear with it because outside of violent radical revolution <laughs> which we are very close to if people aren't careful but anyway that's a different yeah. story um but you know what one of my one of my fun goals that i really want to accomplish so remember how you were saying that you know when you went to the chicago comic con revolution how much do you pay for the table fee? It was supposed to be like $200, right? Yeah. And All me right. and my friend split it in half. Yeah, I spent the whole $200. Or you know how the, they have these big cons where you basically, as an artist, pay oh, yeah. to present? How about this? How about having a co-op con 
instead of you actually paying this 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 group of people like instead of having this one person getting paid for you as an artist to be able to have permission to sell your arts at this time a co-op of artists get together and says hey we're renting out this hotel hall this hotel room hall and the people that come and visit don't come in and pay for admission they just come in and buy your art oh yeah you know there have been a few things like that uh, that's actually how uh, the old zine culture functioned, actually. Like, uh, I don't, actually, the super early comic conventions worked like that, I believe. Because obviously, it was just a collection of nerds, like, renting out a hotel room and just, right. you know, sharing comics, talk about comics, all that jazz. And so. But it became corporatized. Yeah, because, you know, things don't just stay obscure and non-mainstream like that's how punk well punk's not dead <laughs> punk will never die yes. it's incapable of yes. dying it's not dead yet but we're gonna do a great job of trying to kill it yeah <laughs> no i think like like if people still have that sense of personal charity and the will to kind Community. of do it themselves like this weird individualism is a bit strong to say but kind of like the personal drive to go away from themselves and you know have the will to just pull other people up with them instead of just being all fuck you got mine and just taking your ball and running you know like being willing I to just like give this. that helping hand will definitely as long like as this. there are people out there with the helping hand, it's easy. Like, that's kind of how I tackle. That's kind of how I tackle. My you never teaching. want to do the work of actually trying to. You never want to do the work of actually trying to do your work and somebody else's work. The work yeah. is actually getting a change in mindset. To like, hey, you foster a group of people working together. It, it, you can be selfish and still want to work together in the group because their success actually helps yours. And mm -hmm. I think that's a mindset that we need to tackle with people that want more social change. Not that, oh, your selfish mindset is bad. Like, no, let's use that mindset of you wanted to make yourself excel and tie it to somebody else's excel too. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I am, like whenever people ask me art questions, I usually will almost always answer them because one, I like it when people ask me my expert opinion. <laughs> and two, I, I've been in that situation where <laughs> I have no idea what the heck I'm doing and I want to help someone out and get them out of that, you know, situation of confusion by just helping them and, you know, just showing them how I could tackle that problem and learn, you know try to teach them to uh, try to nudge them to the right direction and you know, convince them that hey you know this is how I think but this may not necessarily be how you think so I'm gonna try and teach you how to access that mindset that you would need to go to hunt for your path I'd say it's a it's a weird guru thing that you know <laughs> i don't i don't want it to be a guru thing but it's just me trying to you know it's kind of like uh teaching a man to fish you know like you can show them you can show them how to draw a thing but they're never really going to put it to mind until you explain why to draw a thing that's why usually when somebody's asking me you know about like how i would tackle like finding a certain reference usually the my first question is all right what's the story or okay what kind of references have you looked for or what's your what is that what is the what is it like what's the existing thing like like what are you currently I use, influenced by i want to use a point that if you pick up bleach again you would actually recognize 
there is a scene where um, um, after Ichigo gets like a more stronger version of his sword, his Zanpai Toe, mm. and he was like, yeah, when I was training with Kisuke, he can only tell me the stances. He can only tell me what to do with fighting with a sword. That's all he can teach me. But who really taught me how to use Zangetsu, which is his Zanpanto's name, is Zangetsu. I can only teach you so much. You have to be that teacher of how you apply it. Mm. And that's the thing. You can, o- you can only give some people so much information because if you tell them what to do, how to do it, when to do it, exactly what steps to take, well, then you're not teaching somebody to reach. Yeah, basically, you're just teaching them potentially. how to like, you're teaching people how to reach like your making it, art, yeah, you're making your RC character, basically. Mm-hmm. When you should be teaching them how to think. Well, not how to think, but how to solve problems. Hey, you're what, teaching them, you, you had a right teaching them how to think, not what to think. Yeah. But it has been almost two hours. Oh my God, I didn't realize it was, it's been this long. Um, we're gonna have to do this again. I am- Oh yeah, totally. This was fun. Uh, I am, first, thank you for allowing me to like impose on your stream like, this the, the the picture of the queen that you've been working on it actually i know you're probably not gonna say this but it almost looks complete to my eyes maybe because of the pullback hmm. but it actually looks wonderful um i'm gonna have to do some of my art stream sometime soon oh yeah totally yeah it's yeah i should uh yeah i should probably invest in figuring out how i can like multi-stream or something like that because you know, it would probably be, be we'd probably benefit from like figure out a multi-stream system. I don't know how uh, Twitch does its multi-stream system. But I know uh, Pick Ardo can do multi-stream systems if you like pay their service fee. It's kind of it's kind of weird with Pick Ardo, but you know, with their service fee, they let you do multi-streams together, like simulcasting and all that stuff. That's kind of weird with that. Disconnected. Oh shit. Well, I have restrict, and they let you sell much simul trick. No, I mean, uh, I'm talking about like two guys or working together. I got disconnected. Oh shit! Twitch is disconnected things. Oh shit! Oh shit! <laughs> Yeah, well. Ah, shit. <laughs> well, it looks like, you know, I got disconnected too hard. I got blown way too far. Meeting ID is invalid. Fuck nuts. Ah, you know what? I could just give this a wrap. I'll call it a wrap.